Hey there, my name is Aaron Shine. I'm a postdoc at the Data Science Institute at Columbia. And I'm gonna talk about a randomized experiment of friends texting each other reminders to vote in the 2018 midterm elections. This is joint work with some of my collaborators at Columbia, Keon, Victor, Danya, Dave, and Don. And we worked with this app called Outvote, which helps its users systematize the process of reminding their friends to vote. So a user will first sync their phone contacts with the app, and the app will then display information, public information about their friend's voter registration, like what party they're registered with, what state they're registered to vote in, and users will then use this information to decide who they want to remind to vote. The app in asks the user to create a queue uh, of friends they intend to message. And once the user has checked a few of their friends that they want to message and they click get started, the app immediately takes the user to a messaging interface for the first person on their queue. They are presented with a default message which they can send as is or edit. And when they do press send, um, the app immediately takes them to a messaging interface for the next person on the queue. Now, during the three months before the midterm elections, Outvote implemented a light touch randomization scheme, hoping that it would allow them to assess the causal effect of their users' messages on turnout. So for queues of five of length five or greater, the app would randomly skip contacts in the queue with a small probability, 0.05. Um, so a user would click send, and then instead of immediately getting taken to the next person in the queue, the app would first flip this coin, and with a 5% chance, the app would actually skip that person in the queue. During this time, 5,000 unique users queued around 500,000 contacts that were subject to this randomization. They were in queues of five or greater, and ultimately those users sent about 132,000 messages. So we wanna use this randomization scheme to assess the causal effect of users' messages. Uh, we're gonna define the treatment to be binary. So if a subject um, was messaged by any output user during the, sub during the study period, uh, then we're gonna say that they were treated uh, and uh, zero otherwise. So one and zero otherwise. And the outcome we're ultimately interested in is whether that subject voted. And again, this is publicly, inf publicly available information uh, not who you voted for, but whether you voted. Now, if the treatment were randomized, we would be able to estimate the average causal effect. Um, but in this case, whether a subject actually received a message is not actually randomized. Um, it is endogenous. And so we're going to use the uh, we're going to use these random skips to define an instrumental variable for each subject which we're going to interpret as a random assignment. Um, but we have to be careful when defining these instrumental variables from the, um, these random skips for a couple reasons. So first, users, um, if they notice a skipped contact in their queue, they were able to just quit the current queue and create a new queue and add that skipped contact where the contact would again only be skipped with a 5% chance. So a user could just re-queue the same contact over and over enough times um, until they were given a chance to message them, which in practice was not many times. Um, second, multiple users could queue the same contact. So at a high level, there are multiple queuing events that are associated with the same contact. And so we have to be careful in how we map those to a single random assignment. And the way we're gonna do that is by defining um, this instrument to be one, if the uh, subject was not skipped the very first time they were queued by any user and zero otherwise. So, and we're gonna interpret that as saying, um, subject I is assigned to receive the treatment if they are not skipped in their very first queue. Um, and they are assigned to not receive the treatment or assigned to be a control otherwise. Now, random assignments raises the prospect of non-compliance. So um, some subjects that are assigned to receive a message, um, so they are not skipped in their first queue, do end up, do end up receiving a message. Um, 
or sorry, do not end up receiving a message. They're assigned to receive a message, but they but they uh, don't end up receiving any message. And this non-compliance is two-sided. So on the other side, some subjects are assigned to not receive a message. So they are um, they are skipped in their first queue, but they do end up receiving a message from an outvote user. And to be more specific, uh, about 29% of subjects that were assigned to receive a message did not end up receiving a message. And the reason is that users are creating long queues, um, median length 22, uh, and they are messaging, 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 and then eventually they get tired and they abandon the app. And so they leave a lot of contacts on their queue who were not slated to be skipped by the app. They leave them unmessaged. And on the other side, about 13% of contacts that were uh, assigned to not receive a message do end up receiving a message. And again, it's because um, you know the same user is queuing a contact multiple times or multiple users are um, queuing a contact. Now, in, if we have a binary instrument and a binary treatment and outcome, this maps us to a very standard um, setting where we can consistently, where we can identify what's called the complier average causal effect. This is the average causal effect in the subpopulation of subjects who are compliers. Um, these are compliers are subjects who would receive the treatment if and only if they were assigned to. Um, and we can, using the data generated from this experiment, we can consistently estimate the case using, um, using the IV estimator here, where the Numerator is the intent to treat effect. That's simply the difference in voting rates between subjects that were uh, assigned to, re to receive the treatment uh, versus assigned to not receive the treatment. And the denominator is the compliance rate. This is going to estimate the proportion of subjects that are compliers. Now, even though the case is identified in this case, uh, there are still a couple challenges in precise estimation. So the first challenge is that to actually observe the voting outcomes, we need to match subjects to the voter file. And this process is inexact. What we actually observe is not whether subject I voted, but whether the person we match subject I to in the voter file voted. And so because this, this matching process is inexact, we have measurement error on the outcomes. And in this case, we can show that this measurement error um, is, is a certain kind of error. It's, it's non-differential with respect to assignment. And we can show that that kind of error is going to uh, lead to a bias in our estimator, a specifically attenuation bias that's going to drive our estimate to zero. And you can kind of see why that happens. If Imagine if all of the subjects were mismatched to the voter file such that their outcomes were just randomly drawn from the population, then we would not expect the uh, voting rate in the assigned treatment group to be different than the voting rate in the assigned control group, right? And so the, the numerator, the ITT here uh, would in expectation be zero. So this kind of measurement error is going to drive our, our estimate to zero. And the other uh, complication that we have is uh, in the compliance rate. So in our case, um, the non-compliance is very high. Only about 16% of subjects are compliers. And so a high non-compliance rate is going to drive the variance of our estimator. So we're not going to be able to estimate the case with, um, with high precision. So to deal with the first problem, uh, outvote, so outvote matched subjects to the target smart, to, to, to the voter file, um, using a, a simple matching system, using basically just the phone number and the name information that was stored in the user's phone. Uh, we obtained some data from PredictWise, which um, has access to a much richer, much richer sources of data including proprietary marking databases um, that are very useful for matching subjects to the voter file. And we found that these two different matching systems, they agreed for about 30% of subjects. So 30% of subjects were matched to the same file in the target smart voter file um, by both matching systems. And so we assume that this subset of subjects has much lower measurement error 
than the others, and we refine our analysis to these um, these thirty percent. And to deal with the other issue, so in the in the running example so far, there's just been these three people in the queue, but in reality, the queues were very long. And the user would message for a while, eventually get tired and exit the app. And everyone in their queue after they exited would be unmessaged. And we know just from the design of the experiment that about 95% of these um, of these contacts were supposed to receive a message and are thus driving the non-compliance rate. So we define this variable for each subject, queue position, which is the position that they took in the very first queue um, that they were in by any outvote user. This is a this is a pre-assignment variable for each subject, and we're going to use this to refine the study population down to one with a higher compliance rate. Um, if you look here, um, if you look here, you can see that. Um, Subjects that were in higher positions uh, had exhibited higher compliance rates. So for example, subjects that were in at most position 50 in their first queue, um, they had about a 30% compliance rate. So we want to define a maximum uh, queue position and refine the study population to only subjects that were, that were uh, in positions up to that point. But we have to also consider that uh, the actual size of the study population is also going to is also going to contribute to the variance of the estimator. So, for example, if we define the study population to be only people that were uh, in the very first position in their queue, that's going to define a very compliant subpopulation, but it's going to define also a very small one. So there's this trade-off, and we can formalize that trade-off by computing a proxy for the expected power. Of the analysis. So this is essentially um, based on the expected variance of our estimator. And we're doing this with an assumed effect size. So we're not looking at the actual outcomes. And we find that the cutoff that optimizes um, the expected power of the experiment is, uh, is, is 104. So in other words, the subpopulation um, that is going to minimize the expected variance of our estimator are the subjects that were in at most position uh, 104 uh, in their first queue. I'm including these slides um, just so that you can look at them. I don't have time to dwell on them too much, but we have a consort diagram in the paper that defines clearly exactly how we refined our um, study population. So what I just went through in the last few slides is is that we first uh, refined the study population based on mitigating measurement error. And so we took about you know, the 30% the of subjects that um, whose matches were the same by both outvote and predict wise. And then we refined um, down to a compliance subpopulation, but one that optimally traded off between the size n and the compliance rate. And we're left with what we're calling the refined study population of about 27,000 subjects. Uh, in this study population, uh, the IV estimator uh, is about 11 percentage points. You can also add covariates that are available in the target smart database, demographic variables like race, age, gender, and so on. And if you adjust the estimator using covariates, uh, you get a case of around eight percentage points. Uh, and eight percentage points and significantly non-null. This is a fairly profound um, effect size for get out the vote nudge. So for comparison, uh, automatic text reminders, so spam texts have meta-analysis puts that effect at around half a percentage point. And then on the other side, the sort of gold standard of get out the vote nudges, door-to-door uh, -door canvasser, meta-analysis puts that effect size at, at about six per percentage points. So this is a single study and, um, and there's more in the pipe, but, uh, but as of now, it looks like texts from friends or close contacts might be as effective as a door-to-door -door canvasser. This was particularly exciting um, when it came out during the last election cycle. 
because door-to-door -door canvassing was severely limited by social distancing. And so uh, the idea that a socially distant tactic like friend-to-friend -friend texting could replace door-to-door -door canvassing was particularly exciting. And we designed in 2020 another follow-up experiment on Outvote, which uh, we conducted and we're currently waiting for outcome data on. Uh, and so we'll soon see if this, uh, if this um, effect replicates. Um, and uh, so stay tuned for that. I'm going to stop here, but, but I look forward to your questions and um, looking forward to speaking with you at the conference. Thanks.